Yeah. Snap. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so you guys got two handouts today. Um, one is extra, or assignment 201, your first assignment for this class. It's not due until the 28th of September, so you still have quite a ways to go on it. But this is the kind of thing that can fill in. If you finish a little early today, you can start working on it because it's a combination of modeling and then how are you actually applying and using the textures. Um, so we'll go over more details about it as it gets a little bit closer. Um, and you'll have some time in class to work on it. So we'll, we'll discuss that. But I at least wanted to get that handed out to you so that you know that it's there and that it's coming. Uh, for today, we're going to work on exercise 207. Uh, which is, again, flipping back into the V-Ray world for a bit. I will walk through the V-Ray stuff and then turn you loose on the V-Ray stuff. And then we'll come back and do a second part that has to do with some modifications to the, um, the components that you built, the bridge, little concrete thing, and the little spiders. Uh, and we'll talk about how to make those into a composition so that you can have a rendering there. Um, so for what we're doing today, we're going to talk about something that's called texture mapping. And basically texture mapping means I have a texture, let's call it shingles or flooring or something, and how does that apply and scale and look on a particular object? And you guys may have discovered this earlier, some materials are really easy, some materials are really hard, and so we're going to try to work through that. Um, what I'd like you to do is uh, establish some objects that we're going to play around with. Uh, and so you guys remember this from last time, where we built some basic objects. Uh, I'm a little bit more scripted in terms of the objects that I want. Uh, the first one is going to be kind of a wall-like object. Um, and I think I say uh, 12 feet by 1, feet, one foot and then um, 8 feet tall. So let me do the 1 foot there. And we'll go 8 feet there. Uh, and then in front of that, I'm going to do a few other objects. I say a cube. Go ahead and do a cube here, and then a sphere, um, the sphere is below the, the ground plane, so I'm going to move it up, and then a cone and a pyramid. Pyramid too, and these are all pre pre-made objects. I'm just picking picking them. Uh, oops, that's too big. And this is so that we can practice the texture mapping. Uh, is on them. All right, so I have my objects here. And if we switch into the shaded mode, we could see kind of the basics of the objects that I created. Um, before we get too much further, I want to establish a few things like uh, an infinite plane underneath, do a little bit so that when I do the renders, I actually get something. Remember, if I were to render right now, I'd end up with white objects on an entirely black background. That's not the look I'm going for. So I'm going to add an infinite plane. And I'm going to do that right here by clicking on the V-Ray infinite plane, which will drop it in. I would, however, like that to be on its own layer. So I'm going to come over to my Layers window here. I'm going to right click on Layer 1 and say Change Object Layer so that it's on Layer 1. I'm also going to go ahead and rename this. So I just double click it. And we'll call it IP for an inf infinite plane. Uh, and then I'm also going to come here and I'm going to lock it so that I can't select it. It's just there. Okay. Uh, on layer two, I'm going to create my directional light. So I'm going to call it directional light. Uh, and then I'm going to come up here, pick my directional light icon. And I'll use my uh, cube that I drew to go ahead and, and assign that light. Uh, and again, it's on the directional light layer. And then I can lock that layer as well. So let me go back to the default, and then I'll lock that layer as well. So I can't actually select the light. I can't select the infinite plane, which is my goal. Okay. So I have those two things set up. Uh, and now if I were to render 
I get white objects on a white background. Uh, we'll do one other thing really quick. I'm going to go into my V-Ray options, so the O for options. And then I'm going to come to environment, and I'm going to change the background from black to white. Uh, and that's just in case I do a rendering where I see the horizon. Uh, it's going to be all white. So I'm not worried about uh, any kind of special environment. I'm just worried about um, having a white background, a little bit of light in the scene, and then we're going to apply some materials. Okay? So I'll give you all a second to catch up with me because I want you to kind of follow along as I start to uh, apply this. So I'll go ahead and, and pause, and then we'll come back to it. Okay, enough of you seem to be uh, where, we're, where we're going. So I have this uh, composition roughly set up. And in, in this time, it's not so critical that we stay in the same view every time when we render. It's really it's about learning how to do the texture mapping on the objects in the first place. So in order to, to see and to understand how texture mapping works, the best thing to do is to use a texture that's very distinct. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my materials. So I'll click on the M icon. And then I'm going to right click on Scene Materials. And I'm going to load a material. And so you guys already have uh, materials that we've been downloading. Um, and I'm going to go to, uh, I think it's under Siting, Wood. And I'm going to pick, um, I think it's this one, the random width planks. Yeah, it's this one. So what this is is, um, is it's, it's a bunch of planks that have different widths, but it's kind of blatantly obvious that it has a strong pattern to it. Uh, you could you could pick a different material. Instead of the wood siding, you could do. Um, let me see here. It has to be something strong. Under metal, you could pick like. Uh, you know, those aren't the best. Never mind. Don't pick a metal. The concrete would be fine if you did the board form or one of the ones with horizontal seam. Something like this would be fine because, again, you get a strong pattern that goes across. Right? I'm going to use the planks, but you could pick a different one. It's OK with you. It's, uh, it's up to you. So what I'm going to do is the first thing that I'll work on is I'm going to work on the wall object because that tends to be the easiest for people to, to grasp in the beginning. Um, it's either that or the, the cube. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pick the wall. I'm going to right click on my material, and I'm going to say Apply Material to Selection. Now, since we're looking at texture mapping on this, we really need to see a preview of the material so we see what we're looking at. So instead of being in shaded mode, I'm going to click on the little triangle next to my view here, and I'm going to switch to rendered mode. And when I switch to rendered mode, we see a rendered preview of my material. It's not an ideal. It's not perfect, but it gives us a, a general sense of what it looks like. So if I look at my object right here, right, we can see that my, my texture mapping right, in its default state, the top doesn't line up with the sides. Right? And I'd really like to change that. So I'm going to use the most basic kind of mapping uh, that's available, which is called box mapping. And so I'll go ahead and I'll select my object. It's highlighted in yellow now. And I'm going to come over here to the right where I have my properties panel. And so this is general information about my object. The third option over is texture mapping. It looks like kind of a curled piece of paper that has uh, orange and white checkers on it. I'm going to go ahead and click on texture mapping, and this brings up the texture mapping. If I had a texture map already applied, I get more than just the default options here. And so it's important to, to recognize that I can use multiple uh, maps. Generally, it's best to just keep it to one for simplicity. Okay, so I'll go ahead and I'll pick the object that most closely matches the object that I'm uh, working with. So in this case, the object that most closely matches is a box. So I'll go ahead and say apply box mapping. And then I have to look up here because even though I clicked the button, it's not done yet. I have to look up here and it'll say first corner of base or bounding box. In all likelihood, you just want a bounding box because it's a box. So it makes it really easy. We'll go ahead and click on bounding box. The coordinate system, we haven't gotten into C planes yet. Um, generally, the default is the right option, so we'll go ahead and say world. Do I want it to be capped? That means, does it have a top on it? Yes, it does. So I'll click yes. And now we see that as I did that, 
the front side here matches up with the top. And so the texture wraps as I go around the object right there onto the top. So if I were to go ahead and render right now, to see the final view. And I recognize this can be a little painful to wait for the renders, but this is the, the nature of V-Ray. Right? But what we're seeing is that the texture is applied going up the face here. It turns the corner and then continues along, right? which is the important thing. Okay? If, however, I'm going to go ahead and close this rendering because we don't need to continue. If, the, if we look at the end, we can see that the texture is applied much smaller at the end than it is on the side. And so uh, it's impossible for the end to wrap as well as the side, because obviously you have to pick one or the other. Um, but in this case, I don't like the end because it's way too dense. So we're going to come over here and look at our mapping again. Okay? So once again, I have the object selected. I'm going to look over here at my mapping. And we have a variety of information that's, that's available to us now. Okay? So under type, we have box, projection, closest point, and texture space is single. Okay? Then we have an x, y, z position and an x, y, z rotation of where the texture starts on the particular object. Generally, the default is just fine, and generally, it's the center of whatever the object is that you, you drew. Okay? Down here, we have something called x, y, and z size. Okay? And if we look at this, this value is in inches. So 144 inches would be 12 feet. Right? 12 inches would be 1 foot. And 96 inches would be exactly. So right now, it's squeezing the texture onto each of these surfaces. Okay? If, however, we see that we have some options here, if I click on 1, 1, and 1, it will reset. And I'll have each object is applied, right? each texture is applied at the 1 inch scale, which is way, way, way too tiny for what we're after. Right? So let me select my object, and I can go back. Right? This last button on the end goes back to the original, right? 12 feet, 1 foot, and 8 feet. But I also have the ability here, x equals y equals z, right? And what that does is it says, OK, look at my object and apply the same scale of texture on the face, on the top, and on the side. Okay? It's a little hard to grasp until we get through it a little bit more. But generally speaking, the x equals y equals z especially in a box map, is how you want to apply it. Okay? Changing this value, so you see it's 84, 84, and 84 right now. If I were to change this value to, say, um, 75, let's do it more drastic, 40, 40, and 40, you'd see that the, the repetition of the pattern increases. Right? So the smaller this number gets, the more I'm repeating it. So I'm going to go back to x equals y equals z. What was that, 84? And instead of changing it there, I'm going to come down here to my last three options, the UVW offset, the UVW repeat, and the UVW rotation. Okay? And these really take a bit of experimentation to see what they do. Right? The repeat is the most common one that we're going to do. And I recommend checking the box for lock, which means that you only have to change the value once. And this is how many times is the individual piece of pattern repeated on your object. So if we take a second, and you guys don't have to do this, but if I pull up that material and look at the component parts of that material, this was under siding, thank you, wood, and it was the random width. Right? If I look at the, uh, let me see here, this would be the diffuse. Let me pull this up. Here's the pattern that this material is based on. Okay? So it's a square, right? And this this would be one unit by one unit. Okay? So right now, because my UVW repeat is set at one, this image is applied, right, across this face. Okay? If I change the UVW repeat to two, I'll get two of those images repeated across the face. Okay, so I get a, a higher density 
If I change this to 3, right, I'll get a higher density still. So it's, it's, a, it's applying the material more times to my, to my face. Right? Generally, this is where we're going to be changing uh, to match what we want it to look like. And this is a lot by eye, what feels right in your particular drawing uh, or rendering, so to speak. So in this case, you know, maybe a 2 is about right based on the size of the, the wall and the size of the boards, something like that. Okay? The other option that we have here is the UVW rotate, right, which can change the rotation of the texture and how it's being applied. So if I, if I, and I can never figure out which one is which, so I generally guess and check. Uh, so the first one I'll change to 90 and we'll see what happens. Basically nothing, so we'll go back to zero there. And the second one I'll switch to 90. Oh, that didn't help. We'll go to zero and I'll change the third one to 90. There we go. And that then changed my object so that it's now going around the corner of my, my, my object instead of up and down. Right? But again, I might have to come back and I might have to adjust the UVW repeat. Maybe it needs to be back to 1.5 right? so that I'm getting uh, the result that I want. Okay? There is the ability to change this in a slightly different way, and I'll show you that in just a second. Okay? So that's kind of going through the texture mapping options. Okay? When we come back to my little cube here, well, it's basically the same as the, the wall here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to apply my box mapping to it. Right? It's a bounding box, it's world, and it is capped. Okay? I didn't apply my material yet, so let me go ahead and go to materials. And I'm going to apply material to selection. And we can now see my object. Okay? So once again, I'm going to come back here into my options and I'm going to choose x equals y equals z. Right? And now I can look at my object and I can see that it's wrapping up and over and to that side. Okay? Well, what if I didn't want it going this direction, I wanted it going the opposite direction? Okay? We talked about before with the object selected, I can come over to the UVW rotate and I could play around and hope that one of these would change it, which of course it's not going to, um, would change it the direction I wanted to, right? which it's not. But instead, I can do something else. So with the object selected, I can come up here to these um, tools once again, and I can click on this button that says Show Mapping. And when I click on Show Mapping, it's going to give me this little dotted yellow rectangle. Okay? And you guys already heard how much I love the gumball, right? Except I told you there was going to be one opportunity where I really like it, right? This is it. Because the texture mapping is viewed, if I turn on the gumball, I have a really easy way of controlling how this texture mapping is applied. So I'm going to click on the blue arc here, and I'm going to rotate my texture mapping. And it's, of course, doing a terrible job of doing this live, right? let me do it. Oh, come on. Right, so there it is. Right, and I'm controlling. It's hard to see. It's not live previewing. That's part of the problem. Right, I'm controlling based on this gumball how the texture mapping is applied on my particular object. Do you see that? So in this instance, right, it's, it's wrapping around these two sides. Right, if I rotate again, Right, it's still wrapping around those two sides. Let me rotate this way. Right now, it's wrapping up over the top. So I'm controlling how this works. Okay. The other thing I can do is I can control where it starts and where it stops. So this one is at least letting me preview it live. You can see the the little bit darker stripe. I can control where the the texture is starting and stopping on my particular object. So by just dragging and 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 manipulating this, I can control a lot about what is going on in this particular object. Okay? When I'm done, right, I'll select my object and I'll come over here to hide mapping and the mapping will go away. Okay? I could even, let me click on show mapping again, right? I could even rotate at like a 45. Let me rotate it this way. Uh, by the way, you don't have to use the gumball, so I can use just a regular rotate. Right. And now with that applied at 45, we can hide the mapping. Right. And you can see that it's wrapping 
at a 45 up and over this side. Okay, so this this particular piece isn't working correctly, so I need to to do some further manipulation. Uh, but you get the idea of how this can come together. Okay, so again, that's box mapping. So let's say we move on to the sphere here, right? This time, instead of applying box mapping, we're going to come over here and find the, find the closest object to it. It would be a, a sphere. So we'll go ahead and apply the spherical mapping. I have to apply the, the material here as well. Oh, bounding box, world, okay, material, right click, apply material to selection. All right. And so my first sphere mapping causes all of my lines to come together at a point. Okay. If I didn't like this, I can select my object, show my mapping, right, and do a rotation, 90 degrees, and now my, my object is really attractive. <laughs> no, uh, so that point has now moved, right? I could change once again, and I could rotate it this way, right, and we get that. So you can kind of see that I can manipulate that mapping. The same thing happens here. X equals Y equals Z, right? It's already set because it's a sphere. It's perfectly uh, round. My UVW repeat, if I go up in value, right, I'll get a denser material. If I go down in value, right, it gets further apart. Okay. So again, all of the same things apply. Let me go ahead and select my object, hide the mapping. And we're now back to the start. Okay. Let me get to the cone, the next one. I, when I apply this, there isn't a cone listed. So in this instance, I have to apply a different kind of mapping. Uh, the closest, I think, to it is a cylinder. So I'm going to go ahead and apply a cylinder. Once again, I'll pick bounding box as my default. World, and it is capped. Let me go to materials, and let me apply material to selection. And so now I have this. It's reasonable right, on this edge, but it's a little wonky on that edge. Right? So it may take a little bit of, of manipulation. And the truth is, in all reality, I'll pick a different type of mapping for this. Uh, but this is kind of the closest default that I can do. Right? I can do some basic rotation. Oops. I can turn on my mapping, and I can do some basic rotations, right, depending on where I wanted it to go and have it look a little bit better. Okay? I'm going to come back to this one and revisit it in just a second. Go ahead and hide the mapping. Same thing here with the pyramid. All right, let me apply my material to it. All right, and this time I'm going to go back. And so the pyramid is a little bit interesting because I could use a cylinder mapping. Right, but I could also use a box mapping. It kind of depends on the look that I'm trying to do. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and do a box mapping for it this time. And have it be capped. And so I need to show the mapping. And I'm going to make a few adjustments. So there's, there's my box. Right? I'm going to rotate it 45. I hope it's not going to let me. Let me rotate it this way. so that it now lines up with my object here. And then I'm going to rotate it, the whole thing, 90. And so you can see, as I start to manipulate, I can cause that whole side to line up and wrap across. Right, so again, it depends a lot on where in the view and what you're trying to, to accomplish with it. Okay? So these, these manipulations take a little bit of practice to see what looks right. And you have to basically practice. And so a lot of today is playing with it, seeing what happens, et cetera. But I am going to show you a more advanced technique. I know, shocking. There's a more advanced technique, right? Uh, for how we can do the mapping and get a little bit more for these particular objects. And this happens primarily when we get to an object that's just more complicated. Uh, and so let me go ahead and select this, hide the mapping. And I'm going to work with this pyramid. And I'm actually going to go ahead and copy it first. And I'm going to create a second copy of it. 
so that you guys can see the difference. So that was the original one that I was working with. This one, what I'm going to do first is strip off the mapping. So I'll go up here to delete mapping. All the mapping goes away. And now, with this selected, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to go to um, custom mapping. Right? And when I go to custom mapping, right, select a surface or a mesh to use as the custom mapping. You know what? I don't think it is custom mapping. Hold on. Yeah, it's unwrap. Sorry. What did I say in here? Yes, unwrap. Good. Sorry. I'm going to go to unwrap. And it's going to say select seams. And so if you've ever done like objects, like if you were in 131 and you had to cut out the little like um, triangular pyramid or whatever, flat, and then fold it together. Does that make sense to anybody who was in that? That's basically what we're doing, only we're controlling how the material is applied. So the first thing is it's saying select the seams. So where do I want the seams to be? So let's say I want the seam to um, start on the back edge there because it's behind me, and then I want it to cut around here and here. And we'll leave it right there. Okay, so I go down and I slice. This is if I had a knife, I'd slice it and then I'm going to fold it flat. Okay, so I have those done. I'll go ahead and hit enter. Okay, and so I have that. Now, in order to see it, I have to come over here to the UV editor and I'm going to draw a square over here. And I'll see my object. I know, it takes a little bit. So I have this UV editor, but there it is. There's the bottom, right? And there's the, each of the pieces of my um, triangle. Now over here, right, when I have the UV editor showing, the UV editor icon is this one, by the way. Right? Um, it's saying use the material or use a texture. Um, right now I can't see any of it, so I really want to use a texture, right? And we can see something by default. You know what? I have to turn off, and I apologize for this. I have to turn off the infinite plane so I can actually see it. It was being hidden. Okay? So the material, I just get gray. It doesn't give me any, any good. If I click on Use Texture, I can see right, a preview with these squares of how this is being applied. Okay? Instead of that, I'd really like to see my actual texture. So I'm going to come over here. Instead of the UV grid texture, I'll click on this little plus icon. And if you guys get a little lost, this is the more advanced. We'll get to it. We'll review it, etc. But I'm at least showing you for first first draft here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick a bitmap texture, and I'm going to go to my flash drive and pick that uh, material. Whoops, the material that I actually am working with. And down here to siding, wood, random width, diffuse, and I'll go ahead and say OK. And there it is. Okay. So now this object here is this object. So if I manipulate this, all right, so let me first let me scale it down a little bit. All right, makes the texture over here get bigger. But now if I rotate or adjust this, say I rotate it like that, the texture on this object changes. Okay? So it's a little tough to, to necessarily get. Um, if I move the object here, it changes over here. So this is a custom mapping for the object. And you can see that because I picked the seam as being this back edge, right? The rest. So I'm going to start back up about five minutes early because I had some really good questions that I want to talk through uh, and, and hopefully explain a little bit better. Um, and I cleaned out the computer, so apparently I can keep recording. Um, so one of the things that um, came up was what the other styles of mapping really are. And so I'm going to go ahead and apply this material again. Um, apply material to selection so that we can see it. Uh, and I want to show you what some of the other um, mapping strategies are. So we did box, and we did sphere, and we did cylinder, which makes sense. But there's a couple other ones. There's surface and planar. And what planar does, for example, is it says, OK, I have a plane. And even if you pick bounding box, uh, world, and then UV. It says, I have a plane, apply the texture straight down on this object, and then stretch it along the sides. So if we look carefully, while this looks the same as a box map, 
Can you guys see how we've got the individual little dots here? And when we look on the side, it looks like streaks that are running down. This is as if we're projecting straight, up, straight down on my object. And when it gets to the sides, instead of switching and projecting to the sides, it's just stretching the pixels along the length of the object. So whatever the color is right on the edge, it just stretches down the object. So if I were to zoom in here and actually do a render, bear with me. we would get the nice bumpy texture on the surface itself here. But then when we get to the edge, oh, this is a dark pixel, and it just makes a streak. Right? So instead, if we had this same object, uh, let me remove it and apply a box map to it. Same thing, bounding box, world, yes. Right? You can see that the texture, the little dots, wrap around the corner and go down the side. So it's a different way of applying. In this case, it's applying straight down on the top surface, and then applying from the side, and then applying from the other side. Okay? If I did a, instead of a planar mapping, let me see, kind of need a more complicated surface. Let's see here. Um, bear with me for a second. that one. I'm just um, creating two surfaces here that I can lock together. Okay, so let's say that I have this surface, right? We're now into a more complicated surface. Okay, not just a box, etc. Okay, and it also approaches vertical right here. Okay, this is just a flat surface. If I apply my material to it, okay, in this instance, it's stretching up and over. It doesn't look too bad, right? From it's just its default, and that's because by default it's applying a surface mapping. Okay, let's say we had this, and I apply a planar mapping to it. Okay, and we'll go ahead and do a bounding box world, UV, right? When I get to the edge here on that surface, it starts to stretch the pixels, right? Likewise, same kind of thing happens here. If I wanted to, we could uh, adjust this. Go ahead. And There we go. Right, so that we were applying on the top. And it'd be coming down there. It's a little bit better that way. Okay? But in reality, what we want instead of a planar mapping on this, is we want a surface mapping. Let me come back to this. 
and I'll pick surface mapping. And what that does is it follows right along the surface and applies directly to the surface wherever we are at 90 degrees. Right? So in this case, my little lines right, are projected as we go along all the way to right there. Okay? I know they're a little wavy. That's just the, the nature of it. If I were to render it, it would smooth out. Okay? So the, in this context, the surface mapping would be the right choice. So the point is I'm trying to match up whatever the mapping is to whatever the object is that I have. If I had this object and instead I put, delete the mapping on it, and instead I put a box mapping on it, right, I'd get the side here as soon as we, I get a hard line there and I get a hard line somewhere over here, right, where I'm applying the box map, right? So I could rotate this, I could turn the mapping on, I could rotate this and hopefully get it to work, but you can see that it's really not working the way I want it to. So in this context, the surface map would be right. I'm just trying to illustrate the different types of mapping, okay? All right, so let's move on uh, into part three, as I promised. I'm three minutes late. Um, and that is that we want to work with the objects that we've done last uh, class. So I'm going to go ahead and open a, a, I'll leave this one open, and then I'm going to open my, my object from last class, or excuse me, from two classes ago, which was the bridge. And my goal here is that I have made one of the bridge, but if I connect multiple segments together, I can end up with the whole bridge, right? So I've made a small piece, and I'm going to use it over and over again. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to use it as a block. Uh, and before I bring any blocks in, I want to organize the original file. So first thing is that no lights will come through in a block. Um, so you might as well get rid of the lights, because they won't do any good. And the other thing is we don't want an infinite number of ground planes showing up. So I'm going to go ahead and unlock my infinite plane, and I'll delete that. So all I have left is just the object itself. Okay? So there's the object just by itself. I'm going to go ahead and rename the layer that it's on here to be uh, conch bridge. Okay? And then I'm going to delete the rest of these layers because they're not giving me anything either. So I'm simplifying this file as much as I possibly can before I actually do anything with the block. Right? Now I am going to, because materials do come through in a block, I'm going to go ahead and assign the material to this object. So I'll select my object here. I'll go to materials. It looks like I already have concrete applied. So I'll right click and say apply material to selection. There it is. This shape is roughly a box. So I'll come over to my properties. Go to my texture mapping, and I'll apply a box map, bounding box, world, yes. And then I can switch into rendered view here to make sure that it's actually looking the way I want it to. Okay, Pretty good. The texture is probably a little bit too big. So let me select my objects again, go back to my UVW repeat, and we'll go maybe at two. Yeah, maybe a little bit more, two, two and a half. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, So I have my texture applied as a box to the whole object. Perfect. Now I'm going to go ahead and save. So I'll go to File, Save. And again, no lights, no um, infinite plane. I also, it's helpful sometimes to actually move the object so that there's a known point that's at, say, 0, 0. So I might move this to 0, 0, 0. And I'll save one more time. That just helps on the insertion. OK, so there it is. I've saved it. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open my glass from last class. All right, and I'm going to make sure it's configured correctly. So again, I don't need the light. Get rid of the light. And I'll move it so that the corner of this glass is right on 0, 0. Let me move. And I'll say this is 0, 0, 0. There. I'm going to go to my layers, and I'm going to make sure I'm organized. We'll get rid of the, the rest of these layers. Oops. It would help if I click the right button here. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I'll rename this to be uh, glass wall. Now, 
in actual practice, there would be a pretty likely chance that you'd have a sublayer that would be metal spider, and then a sublayer that would be glass pane, and then this would be on the glass pane layer, and this would be on the metal spider layer but unnecessary at this point to, to necessarily do that because we applied the materials to the objects, not to the layers. I'm just showing you that long term it would be. But again, there's a, there's a primary layer and then there's sub-layers for the materials. Once it's here, I'll go ahead and click File, Save. So again, no lights, no infinite plane. Okay? So I have both of those ready. Right? Now in a brand new Rhino file, so again, large object inches, I'm going to actually assemble these together. Right, so those are two external files, and I'm going to bring them in as I start to build. And the advantage here is that I can go back and edit that, that component and change it, change the materials and whatever, and then it will repopulate into my big file. Right? And so this is a, this is a really good way uh, when you get to your final project of modeling certain layers of details and that sort of thing. It's something I use very, very frequently in my own modeling. So now I'm in my, my, my primary. Though this is the one that I'm going to do my rendering in. This is the one I'm going to set up my scene. I'm going to set everything to be looking correct, uh, set my V-Ray options and all of that. So before I do that, I want to go ahead and bring in uh, my objects. So first thing that I want to do is I want to create a layer that's called blocks. And I could be more specific. I could say you know, glass wall block, or I could say blocks. For right now, I'm going to bring them all in on the blocks layer. I'll double click on blocks so that it's active. And then I will go up to the Edit menu, go to Blocks, Insert Block Instance, okay? which is also just the Insert command. I could just type Insert. Okay? From here, I'm going to browse for the file. And we'll start with the bridge. Let me go into my folder here, 136. And there it is. Okay? Now a couple things that are important, right? Insert as a block instance, which is what I want. And I'm going to prompt for where it goes. That's good. And I'll go ahead and say OK. Now once I have that, it brings up the insert file options. Okay, so this is, this is the critical part. We want to embed and link as our choice. Okay? If we just pick link, if we lose the original file, we're out of luck. If we embed and link, it means that the original bridge is in our drawing, but it's also referenced to an external file. If it's just embedded, it's really hard to go back and edit the materials and stuff later. So embed and link is the right option because we can edit the original file and ultimately do an update. So let me go ahead and say OK. And I can now drop it into my scene. Right? So let's just drop it here, for example. Right? Now you see that I can no longer change anything about the object. Right? It's just one object that comes in. Right? We also come over here and we see that I have an object called concrete bridge, and I also have blocks. This block is on the blocks layer, so if I were to turn the blocks layer off, it would go away. But it also, right, all its components are on the concrete bridge layer, so I can turn that layer off as well. So this is one of those weird times where it's kind of technically on two layers. Okay? I'm going to drag the concrete bridge layer to be up under the blocks layer. Right, which makes intuitive sense to me. OK, so now that I have this, I can actually copy and paste it. So let me copy it. We'll copy from right here. And I'm going to paste it several times in a row to start building up my bridge. Right? And let me go ahead and switch into solid, or excuse me, shaded mode. And we can start to see, OK, it's coming together right, on these intervals. And I can copy it further. Put it there. And you can see that I, I can very easily start to build that bridge. Okay? It's not high enough in the air, so let me go ahead and move. V for vertical. And I don't know, we'll go up 10 feet, something like that. So it's actually up in the third dimension. Okay? So I have that set up. Uh, let me set up a few scene things uh, while I'm here, and then I'll bring in the glass wall. Uh, first thing that I want is a directional light. So I'll use this object 
to build the directional light, that's fine. The directional light should be on its own layer, so let me change it to layer two. And I'll call this lights, which will allow me to turn it on and turn it off. So that's there. I do need an infinite plane, so I'll once again put it on its own layer. Infinite plane, there it is. And we'll rename this to be IP. And like before, I'll go ahead and I'll lock that layer like that. So I can't accidentally select it. Okay, so if I were to render right now, looking down on my object, notice that each object comes through, the materials that were assigned come through. So I didn't ever assign the material in this layer, it came from the block. And so there it is as part of the rendered object. Exactly. So we're, we're getting to that. Okay. So let me go ahead and put in the, the wall in the back here. And so I'm going to hide the um, infinite plane for right now. And then I'm going to go back to edit blocks, insert block instance. And this time I'm going to pick the glass wall. So I'll click the little folder here. It was exercise 206. And I'll go ahead. Again, I'm going to pick embed and link. I'll go ahead and say OK. And then I'll drop this into place. Okay. So here we go. I accidentally included the infinite plane. That's a problem because if I copy and paste this, I'm going to end up with lots of infinite planes. It defeats the purpose. So let me go back to the file. Nope, looks like I closed it. Let me go ahead and open Rhino. I like to open new instances of Rhino so I can leave it open. If I just go to File, Open, it will close the one that I have and open the other one. Um, so it's a personal preference. Let me go back to my exercise 206 here. And I definitely don't see an infinite plane with this object. I'm going to File, Save As. Call this glass. Oh. Save. And let me jump back over. Wrong one. There we go. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Edit, Blocks, Block Manager. And I'm going to change the 206 file. Let me go to Properties. I'm going to change it to that glass wall. Why is it coming with an infinite plane? Doesn't make sense. It's not here. might have to copy this and get a new file with it. Not sure what's going on there. Right, let's get rid of this. Get rid of this. Okay, and let me reorganize here. Get rid of oops, these guys. Make that active. Get rid of this. Save it again. Let me jump back to file here. Block manager again. So edit blocks, block manager. Linked file is newer. I can click on update. And now we're back to. I don't know why that was that was causing it. So the, the wall here is running in the wrong direction, so I'm just gonna rotate the block. Like that. And now I'm going to move this. Let me look at it in the top view. I want kind of a, an endless glass wall behind my bridge. So let me move this over a little bit. Right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a command called array, which basically means create a bunch of these objects in a row. Right? 
So I'll type array, right? It's going to say select objects. I'm picking the block. It's going to say number in the x direction. So I have to know which way is x and which way is y. x is going along the red axis, so the number in the x direction will be 1. Number in the y direction, oops, number in the y direction is going this way, so we'll say maybe 20. Okay? Number in the z direction going vertical, I don't know, let's say 10. Okay? Then it's going to say y spacing or first reference point. So this is going to tell me what is the spacing. So I'll go from here to there. Okay? Then it's going to say z spacing, which would be from there to there. And so what it did is it built that wall for me. It's asking me, do I accept it? Right? And so I'll say, yes, go ahead and accept it. And now all of a sudden I have this glass wall that is probably too tall for what I need. But if I set up my view right, and I do a render, I'll get a render that has my bridge in it with a glass wall behind it. Right? And maybe I need a few more, et cetera. But I'm, I'm trying to get that view that is the happy medium. Okay? So the materials came through because of the original file. Um, so now if I were to render it, oh, I have to change. Sorry. Uh, let me go into my V-Ray options. I have to go into environment, and I have to change my background to be white instead of black. So I'll go ahead and say OK, and then we'll render again. So now I'm getting the glass wall repeating behind with the little spiders, right? And I'm getting my floating bridge that's right here. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and close that. Uh, one of the things that I can do is I can also choose to modify these. So let me go back to my bridge. Actually, you know what? I think that's enough. So skip, I, I say in part eight, I talk about cage edit, skip that altogether. Right? Uh, but one of the things that is important that I do want to show is if I were to change the material, for example, or change the texture mapping, that would apply uh, to my objects. So let's say I select this object that's the concrete, I go back to materials, and I really want the rough board form instead. I right click and I say apply material to selection. Right, I now have the rough board form look. Okay. If I go ahead and go to File, Save, and then I jump back to my this. Um, if I go to my Block Manager, which by the way, you can type Block Manager, you'll see that Exercise 205, that file says linked file is newer. That means I made a change. If I click on Update, right, it's going to update the block and therefore change the material. So if I went to materials, rough board form is now there. And if I were to render it, instead of this material, I'd get the rough board form. Right? So it's related to. Right? The one other thing in the interest of clarity, right? once again, I have my blocks. Right? I want to make sure, and I didn't do this, on um, all of these glass wall objects. Right? Let me go ahead and select those objects. Select, sorry, select objects. I put them in on the wrong layer. Right? Let me change those to be on the blocks layer. Right? I should have made that. And then I want the glass wall to be a sublayer of the blocks layer. Right? I'm seeking clarity here. So that now, if I were to turn off the blocks layer, everything, all my blocks go away. But I can also turn off just the concrete and just the glass. Right? So I've got this flexibility. All right. So once I have that, we'll zoom in a little bit more. Right? If I wanted to see, if I wanted to look down and have more of the glass wall below me, right, of course I can take this and we can move it vertically. Move V for vertical. Up there like that. Okay. 
and then we can go ahead and render that view. Okay, so this is what you're going to ultimately do. I wanted to get through blocks so you understood how blocks. You'll create a rendering of this and post it. You'll create a rendering from part uh, one and two. It's just one rendering of your texture supplied, and you'll post both of these uh, to the course website for your exercise 207. Yeah? How do you make the rendering like, not white? Like, well, I mean, to make it like white background rendered instead of black. Background. Instead of black. It's available if we go to the V-Ray options, so the O, and we go to the environment drawer under background, change the one that's black to be white. Oh, thank you. And then it'll be a white background. We'll get to it. Fancy backgrounds in a bit, but. You can you can create it that way, or you can wait until you have it and then do the render and post it. Then, it's up to you. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Good.